I think it, it was Yogi Berra uh, who said, I'm paraphrasing, that uh, predicting uh, is a risky uh, business, except especially if it's about the future. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> to deal both with Armageddon and uh, a prophecy of the return is a, um, a difficult and serious subject. And uh, when I started writing my books, uh, which uh, uh, began uh, almost uh, for almost 40 years ago, uh, the first book was titled The Twelfth Planet, I knew, I knew then almost 40 years ago that whatever volume the final one in the series called The Earth Chronicles will be, uh, it will have to deal with the end of days, which is the uh, name <coughs> given by the Bible, in the Bible to prophecies of uh, the last days, the end time, and uh, <coughs> any other way <coughs> that uh, the term uh, in Hebrew, which is Acharit Yamim, <coughs> is rendered. <coughs> uh, and I delayed, I really delayed uh, writing that final book uh, for two reasons. Number one is that uh, I felt uh, I need to do more research and actually it took another 30 years of research to um, be able to give a, a, a plausible answer, one which I, uh, I believe is the correct answer but uh, at least it should be sufficiently documented to be plausible. <coughs> um, and the other reason is that uh, uh, I don't know if everybody uh, will be happy uh, with the conclusions of that uh, book, The End of Days. Uh, certainly, I think, <laughs> many of those that... Uh, uh, are dealing, the, specializing in the subject of what's about to happen, <coughs> uh, have uh, focused uh, recently on, uh, on 2012 AD. <coughs> uh, if, if, I, if I wanted to be nasty, which maybe I should be, is I will tell you right off that the only thing certain about 2012 that uh, there'll be another presidential election then <laughs> and that no matter who you vote for uh, this time uh, you will say let's get rid of the bum <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> uh, because otherwise what, what is supposed to happen in 2012. Uh, <clears throat> it is mostly linked uh, with the so-called uh, Mayan, Mayan calendar uh, or Mayan prophecies and I'll uh, talk about it in greater detail uh, as, as we go along. <laughs> but uh, as I understand what, what others are saying is that uh, it is a time that uh, is some, something, the present, the past will come to an end and uh, something, something will happen. And when you are uh, pressing those uh, others who specialize in 2012 and you ask them uh, uh, what, what will happen, um, they say, well, uh, there's a planet. <laughs> there's a planet that, that, that makes some great orbit and periodically it comes to our vicinity, and at that time it, uh, it causes all kinds of, of havoc. And uh, in, in uh, connection or in response to, to such kinds of prophecies, my answer is that uh, 
to, or rather to remind the, the audience that uh, the same claims were made in regard, I don't know why, but in regard to 2003, and that uh, that's when the planet, the unknown planet, planet X, uh, will, will arrive and uh, do all kinds of uh, unpleasant things to us, <coughs> uh, or, or maybe good things. And if you will recall, the same kind of prophecies were uh, uh, connected with the with the millennium, the year 2000. And uh, one way or another, they are always uh, coming back to planet X. And if you say, what is planet X? Uh, <clears throat> well, that is the planet about which uh, this guy Sitchin has been writing. <clears throat> uh, so what, what, is, uh, what is this planet X? And uh, when, uh, when really is it supposed to come back to our vicinity and what is supposed to happen and uh, when it does. <coughs> I uh, started to, to write about it, as uh, many of you may know, in my first book, The Twelfth Planet. Uh, it took me more than 30 years uh, to research that uh, material for, for that book. Uh, it was published uh, the first time in 1976. <coughs> the um, uh, English, uh, not hardcover, and softcover, but, but the paperback, the paperback edition, uh, which is still uh, selling uh, <coughs> everywhere, uh, had about 50 printings by now, which is a record for the publishers. Uh, and the book has been uh, translated into uh, some 24, 23, 24 languages. And uh, I can share with you a personal uh, irritation, and that is that one uh, recent uh, night I was awakened from a sleep, which uh, uh, is, is not easy for me lately to fall asleep. And... Uh, the phone, which is also a fax machine, rang around 12.30 a.m. And uh, when I checked who, who, who is trying to reach me at this time, a fax from Hanoi that the publisher in Vietnam wants to translate into Vietnamese, the 12th planet. And though, uh, you know, it's been translated by now to NA, almost any language you can think of, I was thinking to myself, somebody in Vietnam, in Hanoi, after all that uh, that place means uh, to us, uh, <laughs> that, that, that this is really something. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> now what I did in the 12th planet, and maybe that is the reason for its uh, success and for its... Uh, still being so uh, uh, powerfully around, is that I brought to life a civilization that was hardly known before, uh, and that is the Sumerian civilization. I find it, uh, although now more and more I find in articles, in other books, etc., reference to the Sumerian civilization, to the Sumerians, I find that it's still uh, easier for even those who deal with that, like museums, to say Babylonian. For example, <laughs> there is now in Europe uh, an exhibit uh, from uh, ancient Mesopotamia uh, where three museums, uh, the one in London, in Paris, and in Berlin, have combined to uh, put together some of their uh, uh, objects and show them in each of the each one of the three places, <laughs> and uh, they refer to it as the Babylonian exhibit. So, uh, uh, almost 40 years ago, when uh, I or anybody else would say to somebody, "Well, you know the Sumerian civilization," you would get some kind of a uh, blank look. You know, the Sumerian would 
you know, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I brought to life uh, the Sumerian civilization, <laughs> which was really a most amazing civilization. It uh, blossomed out in what is now southern Iraq, in that part of the world. This is the, the ancient Near East, this is the Mediterranean Sea, the, the, the Red Sea, Egypt, uh, Assyria, Turkey, which was the Hittites then, uh, etc. <coughs> so, about 6,000 years ago, <laughs> an incredible civilization appeared there, and all those that deal with it use such words as uh, suddenly, unexpectedly, out of nowhere, because there was no gradual or any kind of uh, precedential civilization that, that you had this and this and this and this is, was a, a, a higher level, a higher stage. Suddenly, from what we may call primitive, though they were not primitive people, <coughs> but you know, they were uh, farmers, hunters, uh, etc. But suddenly there appeared cities, uh, high-rise buildings, uh, organi societal organization, kings, priests, um, um, codes of law, uh, literature, art, music, musical instruments, all of that within <coughs> a very short uh, uh, period appeared about 6,000 years ago. And uh, I sometimes find it necessary to uh, ask people to stop for a minute and think what is 6,000 years. So we are about 2,000 years removed from the time of Jesus. Now that time was about 2,000 years removed from the time of Abraham. And then add to that another 2,000 years, and that's where we are talking about, where this great uh, civilization uh, appeared so suddenly. And uh, without <laughs> devoting the whole evening to that civilization and all the firsts to to which we owe a debt. For example, if, if you look at your watch and you have 60 minutes uh, in an hour, why do you have 60 minutes? Because that's the basic Sumerian mathematical system called sexagesimal day 60. They went from 1 to 60 and then, like we go from 1 to 100 and 101, then we go, they went from 1 to 60 and then 61, so there was day 60. A uh, circle <coughs> has 360 degrees. Why? Because it is 60 times 6. Indeed, the whole Sumerian mathematical system was based on that. 6 times 10 times 6 times 10, etc. So you had 6 and 60 and 360 and 3,600 and, and so on and so forth, up to very high uh, numbers in uh, uh, going uh, some some tablets were found with the, starting with with mathematical tables with two two million one hundred ninety six thousand and tables of division from that <coughs> so the legacy of Sumer be it in in uh, the first wheel and, and so on and so forth <coughs> uh, is, is is really incredible <coughs> so uh, but I want to uh, mentioned tonight <coughs> at least three or three of their first one is writing <coughs> and they <coughs> developed a writing system called cuneiform we were described using <coughs> a, um, a stylus would make wedge like uh, symbols or indentations in wet clay which when it dried uh, would uh, and become a permanent record. I don't have a, a sample of a tablet with me, but uh, let's say that this is a uh, clay tablet, and I once uh, 
held up a copy of my book, not this one, this is a DVD, and I said, uh, which one of the two do you think would last another thousand years? The printed book or the clay tablet? And the answer is the clay tablet. <laughs> so we have uh, writing, which of course meant uh, a language and grammar and literature and, and epic tales and lullabies were written down, recipes, for example, in the book, The Twelfth Planet, I give us an example, <coughs> a recipe for what the French call coco vin, meaning a, a chicken uh, cooked in wine. Uh, there were uh, proverbs. Uh, it, it's really mind-boggling, but I won't spend the whole evening on that. So writing was one of them. Another thing was pictorial depictions. They uh, took uh, uh, stones, mostly semi-precious stones, and made cylinders about an inch or so, sometimes longer, but basically about an inch, a cylinder of an inch, and would engrave, and nobody has figured out to this day how, in this hard stone, they would make an engraving in reverse, like a negative, which when rolled on wet clay would become a permanent Egypt, a permanent <coughs> uh, depiction, the way we uh, say print, print our presses, the rotary uh, presses now, the newspapers. <coughs> so uh, uh, literally uh, thousands of cylinder seals, and even more so, their imprints have been found, and any uh, museum uh, uh, worth its salt uh, has, has, has these uh, cylinder seals or their imprints on, on display. And those uh, uh, depictions uh, tell us a lot, and I will refer to some of them. <coughs> and uh, the third thing that uh, uh, I would like to uh, mention and, and, and stress uh, this evening was the uh, high-rise buildings. Uh, they uh, were the first to use bricks and to build high-rise buildings, uh, st like stage pyramids that would rise 100, 120, 160 or more feet <coughs> high. Uh, some uh, think that uh, these were the Towers of Babel, uh, mentioned in the Bible. Actually, it's not so, but uh, every major city, Sumerian city, had a sacred precinct, and the sacred precinct had such a <coughs> uh, ziggurat, as they were called. And they were used primarily uh, for uh, uh, astronomical observation. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, their knowledge of astronomy, or in the field of astronomy, is one of the most amazing uh, Sumerian legacies. <clears throat> this is, for example, the imprint of a cylinder seal. You can actually see the seal uh, in Jerusalem. There is a museum there called uh, Bible Lens Museum. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this is, uh, if you ask a uh, <laughs> A regular scholar, uh, what what is it? They'll show it. He'll say this is a beer drinking scene, because uh, uh, the Sumerians were also the first to invent beer. Uh, and drinking beer was a social event. Uh, you can see people are coming to participate in that. And beer was drunk through a straw. Uh, the way. I understand in, say, in Latin America or in Argentina, they drink uh, mate, mate tea uh, with, with, with a straw. <laughs> but as many other cylinder seals, uh, they were decorated with celestial symbols. And if you study this one, uh, you find out that uh, it 
depicts the sun. It depicts the earth and its moon. It depicts what we call the asteroid belt, which is a belt orbiting between Mars and Jupiter, and nobody knows, or nobody, I mean, I say nobody because I do. <laughs> <laughs> Others claim they don't know how it came about. It's the remains of some planet that uh, was destroyed, exploded, except that if a planet explodes, the pieces fly in all directions, and in this case, <laughs> they orbit like a belt between Mars and Jupiter. So you also have Mars and Jupiter. Uh, here's Jupiter. You have the asteroid belt, which we have discovered only in modern times. And beyond Jupiter, you have Saturn and its rings, which we uh, did not know about until the invention of the telescope. Now this cylinder seal is from about 2000 BC from 4,000 years ago. So this is an example of the amazing uh, Sumerian uh, knowledge in astronomy. <coughs> but there is even m one more amazing cylinder seal uh, which uh, caused uh, quite uh, an uproar at the museum where it's kept. It's, it's in a museum in Berlin at the time <coughs> when I uh, came across its existence. It was East Berlin, uh, but they cooperated with me. They sent me a photograph. And uh, if you ask uh, uh, scholars what, <coughs> what is the scene depicted, they say, well, this is the god of agriculture granting the plow, a primitive plow, to mankind, a representative of mankind is introduced by a lesser god to the main god who grants the, the, the plow. And uh, just as an aside, I'll say so, you tell those same uh, scholars at the museum or in, in any of their <coughs> scientific magazines say, so there was a god of agriculture and that's how you look. They say, no, no, that's, that's a mythological scene. That's just mythology. But Whatever it is, there is an interesting celestial depiction on this one, and uh, this is what it shows. It shows a star surrounded by planets. Now, the, the, this, this arrow is, is my addition to uh, enable comparison with our knowledge of uh, the solar system. So we have the sun, with not the Earth, we have the Sun in the center, surrounded by planets, all the planets we know of in the correct sizes and in the correct order, except that here there is one more planet, right here, between Mars and Jupiter, where the asteroid belt is now. So according to the Sumerians, there was a planet there, uh, probably, or one must conclude, the planet which apparently broke up somehow. <clears throat> now, uh, if you could uh, get hold of Sumerian guy and say to him, uh, what planet was that and what is the somehow? How, how did that planet uh, break up? He'll say, well, that, that's, uh, <laughs> you're asking me something that is... Uh, been written about uh, in one of our books. It happens to be a clay tablet, not uh, the way we, we uh, think of books. And that tablet uh, is actually part of uh, seven tablets. And uh, once they were discovered uh, in a library in northern Mesopotamia, uh, in an ancient library in northern Mesopotamia, and it did contents of that uh, uh, story on, on those tablets uh, was, was uh, deciphered, uh, they have since been referred as the seven tablets of creation, paralleling the biblical tale of the seven days of creation, six days of actual creation, and then one day 
in praise of, of the Creator. <coughs> so um, uh, this is uh, one of the tablets, I think uh, uh, the fourth one out of the seven, uh, known as uh, the Epic of Creation, <coughs> uh, or sometimes known by its uh, opening lines, which is how the Sumerians used to name their uh, epic tales or, or uh, their uh, tablets in library catalogs, because they were actually <coughs> set in, in, in libraries, and on each shelf there was a tablet that listed all the texts that are on that particular shelf, like a catalog uh, tablet. Uh, so no, it's not sometimes known by its opening words, Enuma, Enuma Elish. <clears throat> now what does the Enuma Elish uh, say? The Enuma Elish says, uh, tells the story how the uh, earth uh, <coughs> came to be, how uh, our moon came to be, how that extra planet came to be, and indeed how the whole solar system came to be. And uh, I devote in uh, the Twelfth Planet and then in, a, in another book, uh, Genesis Revisited, chapter after chapter to explaining uh, this epic of creation. But I'll just give you now the, uh, <coughs> the gist of it in, in a, a couple of minutes. And they say that once the solar system began to coalesce, the way our modern scientists say, around our sun, and the various planets began to form, <coughs> an invader, another planet, thrust out, some, out of some other solar system, uh, passed near ours, but as it passed near our solar system, it began to be uh, uh, pulled in by the gravita gravitational pull of all those, uh, those other planets and changed course. Now you will notice an interesting thing that while all the other planets rotate in one direction, which is uh, counterclockwise as <coughs> we, we say, <coughs> this one uh, orbits in the opposite direction uh, which, uh, uh, being unusual, is called retrograde. <laughs> but as it was drawn in, in the opposite direction, inevitably it collided with one of the olden planets in our uh, solar system, which in the Enuma Elish text is called <coughs> Tiamat. And uh, uh, this planet, the invader, uh, which later was named Nibiru, <coughs> uh, acquired various satellites or moons as it was passing by the other planets. <coughs> Tiamat, which is treated as a female, a female celestial <coughs> entity, uh, had uh, 11, 11 satellites, one of them quite large, unusually large, uh, called in the tale Kingo. And uh, when the clash finally occurred, it referred to in those texts as the celestial battle, uh, Tiamat uh, was hit uh, twice actually. This is just one of the drawings from my books. Uh, was hit by some of the moons, the satellites of the invader, and was broken up. Half of it became bits and pieces, the asteroid belt, uh, which uh, those texts, and the Bible in chapter 1 of Genesis refers to as the hammered bracelet, because it orbits like a bracelet around the sun. And the other half was uh, thrust into another orbit, carrying with it Tiamat's largest moon, to become our planet Earth and uh, its satellite, the Moon, an unusually large one as things go in our solar system. Now, uh, without uh, spending time this evening on the subject, but it's in my various other books, I, for example, you know uh, 
<coughs> what modern science says about uh, uh, our planet uh, Earth, that uh, all the continents used to be on one side, on the other side was just a huge uh, cavity uh, that was filled with water, and it's still called the Pacific Ocean. Uh, if you uh, <coughs> read about uh, the origin of the moon, etc., it all corroborates, it all agrees with this uh, Sumerian uh, cosmogony. <coughs> and now, uh, what happened to the invader? According to the Enuma uh, Elish, the epic of creation, the invader itself uh, became a member of the solar system, a twelfth member, because they counted the sun, the earth, its moon, and not nine, but ten planets. So uh, uh, <laughs> when uh, I discussed <coughs> with my first publisher the title, uh, the suggested title for my uh, book, the first book, The Twelfth Planet, I tried to explain to him that this is really the tenth planet, which is the twelfth member of the solar system. And he said, uh, Sitchin, we'll call it the twelfth planet. <laughs> so it is known as the twelfth planet, though it is in reality the tenth planet. And all the Sumerian tales do include the planet we call Pluto as part of the tale. So I wrote on my website uh, a piece when uh, uh, the uh, astronomers uh, meeting in Europe decided to... Uh, the, uh, I don't know, <laughs> dethroned Pluto and said it's, it's not really a planet, it's a planetoid, it's this. I wrote a piece on my website and said, uh, let, let Pluto stay the way the Sumerians had it. <clears throat> so uh, this is the, the, the planet uh, that uh, remains in orbit and uh, has been renamed uh, <coughs> Nibiru. Now, on many uh, Sumerian and afterwards uh, Assyrian, Babylonian, and, and, and so on uh, depictions, uh, all the 12 members of the solar system are depicted. And uh, you can see uh, the sun, uh, you can see the moon, you can see this Nibiru, uh, whose symbol became the winged disk. Uh, you can see uh, all the others with their symbol. And you can see the seven dots, which is the symbol for Earth. Now, you may well say uh, this is wrong, because we all know that Earth in uh, New Age parlance is the third rock from the sun. Right? <coughs> so there's uh, Mercury, Venus, and Earth. And that is true. But if the Sumerian incredible knowledge uh, was given them, was not acquired by them from their own observations without telescopes and all other modern equipment. If it was given them by somebody, let's assume for the moment, coming in from outside the solar system towards Earth, then they would say Pluto is the first. And then there's Neptune and Uranus. And then there's Saturn and Jupiter. And Mars would be the sixth planet. And Earth would be the seventh planet. So Earth is quite correctly depicted by the symbol of the seven dots, the number seven. <laughs> and uh, this is something I would uh, like you to keep in mind as we proceed with this presentation, because it is uh, very significant uh, towards uh, um, an appreciation of the evidence uh, from the past about the, the future. <coughs> now, uh, the obvious question that uh, anyone, uh, including myself at the time that I started to uh, research and investigate all that, <laughs> would ask himself is, how could possibly the Sumerians know all that 
that uh, the sun is in the center and that's how this solar system came into being and there was an invader and the invader has this great uh, elliptical orbit, etc. And the answer, answer again, it is written, it is written down uh, on, uh, that they are not called tablets, <laughs> they are called uh, cylinders, square cylinders in this case. <laughs> and uh, this one in particular, another one like it, uh, can be seen by any one of you if you go to England, to Oxford, to the Ashmolean Museum. And uh, this is called the Sumerian uh, King List. And uh, it says that uh, about uh, 430,000 years before the deluge, uh, people uh, called Anunnaki, uh, in this text, called Anunnaki, came from their planet and visited Earth and brought civilization to Earth. In fact, it says, this and other uh, records like it, say that civilization was brought down, and the term used in the Sumerian for the civilization is kingship. Uh, that kingship was brought down first time uh, before the, the deluge and was brought down to earth from the heavens uh, the second time after the deluge. And uh, then there are tales, very detailed tales, uh, telling us that uh, at one time, a group of 50 Anunnaki, led by a leader whom they call Enki, uh, came from their planet, that same planet, the planet X, or Nibiru, they came uh, to Earth, and uh, they did not uh, crash land here. Uh, their spacecraft was not just uh, passing by and they said uh, uh, to each other, hey, uh, look, look at that uh, rock down there, let's take a look at it. They came for a reason, they came for a purpose. And the purpose was that they needed gold. They needed gold with which to protect the dwindling atmosphere on their own planet. And uh, the tales, which are very detailed, then tell how Enki uh, came and tried to obtain the gold, how uh, uh, his attempts to get it, uh, to extract some gold from the waters of the Persian Gulf <coughs> did not uh, succeed, so they had to turn to actual mining. And then uh, another leader was sent, called Enlil, and etc., uh, etc., et so what happened. And uh, uh, there are many statues of uh, Anunnaki, male, female, uh, but this one of Enki is the only one where uh, his fist, if you can uh, discern it, is uh, made of gold, uh, which uh, I believe indicates the purpose for which he came. <coughs> now Enki stayed on Earth uh, uh, quite a long time. And at some point, uh, felt that uh, he ought to tell his story of uh, <clears throat> what happened on their planet that made uh, him and his group and the other Anunnaki come to Earth, and what happened on Earth after they came uh, and landed here. And uh, there is an actual text uh, known to any uh, Sumerian or... Uh, uh, Assy Assyriologists, as some call themselves, uh, that uh, they will say, yes, there is such a text that is an autobiography of Enki that starts by saying, when I approached the earth, I saw greenish marshes. We splash landed in the waters. We waded ashore. I commanded so-and-so, and the name is given, to test water and see if there's potable water. I commanded so-and-so to build us some kind of shelter. I commanded so-and-so to see if the, there is edible food. And so on and so on, line after line 
in those tablets. Unfortunately, the complete text of that uh, autobiography of Enki uh, is, has not been found, only fragments of it. I used about 800 uh, different sources to reconstruct the story of Enki because I felt at some point <laughs> in my own writings that it is not uh, enough to tell the story of what happened here through the uh, prism of, uh, of the Sumerians or to some extent the, the Old Testament, uh, the Hittite writings, etc. But it is also important in especially to know why they came, what happened on their planet before they came uh, through the eyes and through the speech of one of them and I chose Enki <laughs> because he did dictate uh, an autobiography. <clears throat> and uh, the tale that emerges from uh, all those sources is that uh, after they landed here and could not get the gold just by uh, extracting it from the waters <coughs> of the Persian Gulf. This is the Persian Gulf and this is today's Iraq. <coughs> uh, another leader, uh, a half-brother of his called, called Enlil came. Uh, he was a more uh, a commander and he was more a scientist. Uh, another member of their family, they were all children of the ruler of Nibiru, called Anu. Another member, a female, who was a medical doctor, came and um, assisted also. And they set up uh, a settlement, or actually seven settlements on earth, at a place that they called in, in Sumerian, Edin, from which the word Eden, the Garden of Eden, comes. Uh, and uh, they uh, chose a central point called Nippur. They uh, nicknamed, nicknamed the navel of the earth because all the other settlements that they established, each one with a certain purpose, including this one as the spaceport, and this laid out as a landing, landing corridor, all of them were equidistant from Nippur. So Nippur was the central uh, city, the uh, uh, site where uh, Enlil had his headquarters, and uh, some of the texts even describe what was at his headquarters, and there was a particular place there called the Duranki, with all kinds of uh, humming, humming equipment that controlled the space flights and uh, and uh, gave information about orbits, etc. And Duranki literally means the bond, the bond heaven earth, the thing that <laughs> links heaven, their own planet, uh, in this great orbit, <coughs> and their settlements uh, on earth. <coughs> so this is what uh, they established, and. Uh, As I said, the, at some point, the, uh, the uh, idea of extracting gold from uh, the waters didn't work. They had to go and do it the hard way. So they kept coming in groups of 50 until there were some 600 of them on Earth. And uh, they used Mars as a way station on which 300 of them were stationed. The numbers are given in those texts. But... Uh, most of those on Earth, those Anunnaki, were assigned to uh, mining gold in East Africa. And there are several texts, and in particular one known as the Atrahasis Epic, uh, that describe a time or an event where those working in the mines mutinied. And they said, no more. Uh, we, this is not the kind of work that we can do. We, we are astronauts. We are supposed to mend spacecraft, not, not to work deep in the earth. And there was a mutiny, and uh, there was great consternation 
among the leadership what to do. And then the same Enki, who was a scientist, <coughs> said, we don't have to abandon our efforts to obtain the gold on which our own survival on our planet uh, depends because we have to protect our dwindling atmosphere with a shield of gold particles. <laughs> because there exists on Earth, already exists on Earth, a being <laughs> which is in many ways similar to us. And all we have to do, and those are quotes from his words in his autobiography, all we have to do is put our mark on it, our genetic mark, and thereby raise that being more to our level so that it could follow our commands, understand our language, and do the work for us. <coughs> and there are the, quite a number of texts called creation texts that describe how Enki, uh, with the help of... Uh, the, uh, their half-sister, who was the medical, do medical chief, chief medical officer, through trial and error, trial and error, kept trying to combine their genes with the genes of the being that they found on Earth, which we may call uh, a Homo erectus, if we wish, and finally succeeded in bringing about what was called in those texts the perfect model. And it so happens that there is a cylinder seal about 4,000 years old showing this goddess, her name was Ninmach, raising the newborn model, model men, Lulu Amelun, as they called it. And she shouted, and these are words in those texts, my hands have made it. Uh, and uh, that is... Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, how we came about. This is the long <laughs> story, which I gave you as briefly as I could, uh, of what the Bible says in uh, chapters 2 and others of Genesis, that a group called the Elohim, which is a plural term, uh, literally meaning the lofty ones, translated God, uh, said to each other, let us, in the plural, let us fashion the Adam. Adam comes from Adama, which is earth, so Adam, literally earthling. Let us fashion the earthling in our image and after our likeness. And this is essentially in one uh, biblical verse <laughs> what the Sumerian tales tell in uh, quite, uh, <coughs> quite a number of uh, crea <coughs> creation texts. <coughs> and then after they achieved that and uh, everything seemed to be in order, the deluge came and destroyed everything. So after the deluge, then, and I, there are tales, by the way, some variant tales describing the deluge and its reasons and its uh, what caused it, and, uh, and, and, and why was one God angry and said, let mankind perish, etc., etc., but that's uh, <laughs> another, it's another evening. <laughs> so uh, after the uh, deluge, when the water subsided, uh, they had to restruct and recreate and restart everything uh, from the beginning, and uh, they could not do it anymore in... Uh, uh, in the Edin, uh, today's uh, Mesopotamia or Iraq, because it was all covered with uh, millions, or now I one should say billions, uh, of, uh, of <laughs> tons of mud, uh, and, and no, nothing could be done there until uh, the earth would, <coughs> would take uh, uh, generations and generations to dry. <coughs> so they shifted uh, the whole project from where it was, if you recall, it was this way. All, everything was anchored on Mount Ararat, the twin peaks of Ararat, which stand out as, as a marker, <coughs> and laid out exactly the same idea of a landing corridor, 
uh, this way. Now they used uh, as one of the facilities uh, to, uh, to, to, to serve their purposes a great platform that they had built here and that survived the deluge right here. And again using this notion of uh, equidistance from uh, there to there to the spaceport which was here uh, and here to uh, create the whole landing pattern, uh, they uh, chose a new mission control center, a new place for the Duran Key, right here. And uh, this place is known today as Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, uh, and I sometimes, uh, either at, at seminars or when, when I took groups with me to tour these places, uh, I would say uh, to them, uh, why, why is Jerusalem sacred? I say, well, uh, it is sacred to, uh, to Muslims because the tale is that uh, Muhammad was taken from Mecca or Medina uh, one night <coughs> on a winged horse and brought to where, to Jerusalem, and there he was taken aloft and visited heaven for one night. So that's, uh, <coughs> but why was Muhammad taken to, to Jerusalem? Why wasn't he lifted just from Mecca or Medina? Well, because that place was already known as a sacred place because the Christians believed that that's where Jesus uh, preached and was crucified, etc. So I said, so why was uh, Jesus uh, crucified in Jerusalem? Uh, he was born in, in Bethlehem. He came from Nazareth. Why, why Jerusalem? Oh, well, because that's where the temple was, the Jewish temple, the temple of Solomon. So why was the temple of Solomon there? Well, <laughs> uh, people don't know. Uh, so I tell them, well, it was there because the same Anunnaki who had uh, this pattern and had Nippur as the navel of the earth and mission control center before the deluge set up this layout and made Jerusalem mission control center after the deluge. And equidistant from it is the spaceport and uh, a, a twin peaks emulating the twin peaks of Ararat, twin peaks are here in the Sinai Peninsula, and twin peaks, artificial ones, because there were no mountains there. So they built two mountains known as the Giza Pyramids. Now, things did not go so well after the reconstruction and the setting up of the uh, alternate uh, mission control center. <clears throat> the Anunnaki, uh, uh, who, uh, according to the tales by Enki and others, uh, were engaged in, in almost constant wars on their planet, uh, had at the time a leader called Anu, <laughs> but uh, he was actually a usurper. He usurped the throne. And uh, uh, under the Sumerian sexagesimal six system of six times 10, 60, etc., <laughs> he ranked as the top rank 60. <laughs> and uh, his successor was a son called Enlil was given the rank 50. But Enlil was not the firstborn son. Uh, it was Ea, or Enki, as previously known as Ea. Uh, Enki, who was really the uh, rightful successor, but he was demoted to rank 40, and so on. So there was a pantheon of 12, matching the 12 members of the solar system, and matching other 
uh, 12 without belaboring it, uh, 12 months of the year, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples of Jesus, and, and so on. So 12 was a celestial number. So the relationships were such that the conflict was almost uh, inevitable, especially since it had a lot to do of who was mothered by whom, who was the father, who was the mother, uh, if this one uh, <coughs> was also uh, the son of, uh, of uh, Anu and Antu, then he was this rank, but if this one was only the son of this one, but not this uh, queen, he had another rank. So the relationship was quite uh, con confused and convoluted and, and, and leading to, to conflict, which, which soon appeared on earth. And one of the um, uh, events that uh, took place, not, not, not uh, uh, too many, uh, relatively too many years after the establishment of that uh, great pattern of lending pattern in Jerusalem and the Space Force, etc., and the, the two artificial mountains in Egypt, <coughs> was that uh, uh, wars broke out. And the first war that I named in my book, uh, uh, The Wars of Gods and Men, <coughs> uh, the Pyramid Wars, because there was a series of them, had to do with, with, with these facilities, because in the Great Pyramid, one of the two especially, which is the only one that has an ascending passage and chambers, all the others have just a descending <coughs> passage. They uh, uh, were, were, were a prize that one side tried to deprive from the other. And uh, the first series of pyramid wars uh, took place there. Uh, in that particular war, the two main protagonists were the main son of uh, Enlil, called Ninurta, and the main son of Enki, called Marduk. And uh, in that war, uh, it was Ninurta uh, who was the victor. And uh, this victory was commemorated in some cylinder seals and other depictions. Uh, this was his uh, symbol, uh, the, uh, the eagle. And this was his victory's uh, depiction, how, <coughs> how he won the war over the two pyramids. And uh, another depiction where you see actually all three pyramids. And this, by the way, is another uh, uh, of the proofs of which I have many, and I deal with it uh, extensively, of who built the pyramids and when they were built, and that you see that already in Sumerian times, which preceded the pharaonic times by uh, uh, thousands of years, uh, the existence of the pyramids was, was already known. Around uh, 2900 BC, a Sumerian king uh, called Gilgamesh uh, went in search of immortality. Now, <laughs> the whole business of immortality uh, doesn't really exist because all the tales tell us that these so-called gods, the Anunnaki, were both born and died. And there are tales about both births and, 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 and death. But it is all relative. That's why the Greeks called the, the, the gods, they borrowed the Sumerian pantheon, they, 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 they called them the immortals. But it was only a difference in, in what a year is. If the Anunnaki come from a planet whose orbit is about 3,600 of our years, to them it is one year. If you would ask an Anunnaki, how old are you? He'll say, whatever, I'm 20 years old, which means my planet, Nibiru, made 20 <laughs> rounds around the sun. Uh, if you ask uh, somebody here, so we won't ask people for their ages, of course, <laughs> but you ask how old are you, and he'll answer, it means my planet, 
where I grew up, to which I genetically belong, made X number of orbits around the sun. That's a year. So, but anyway, Gilgamesh was the son of a goddess. And uh, he felt, he came to his mother, and he actually was not only a demigod, but he was two-thirds divine because his mother, not his father, his mother was a, a god, a goddess. And he said, if I'm two-thirds divine, two-thirds Anunnaki genetically, why should I die like a mortal? And she said to him, you're right, but in order to attain our longevity, you have to go and be on our planet. <clears throat> so he went in search of immortality, and the Epic of Gilgamesh is a well-known literary work uh, from antiquity, translated in antiquity already in, in many of those ancient languages. Now, where did Gilgamesh go? Uh, in search of immortality, he had to go to places from which he would be taken aloft to the planet of the gods. So if you remember this design, this is what I showed you. <laughs> this is Jerusalem, which is only mission control center. Uh, he had, and this one, this one, where is it? This one was destroyed in the Pyramid Wars. So he had two places to go. One was the great platform in the mountains here, and one was the spaceport itself. And so around 200, 2000, 2900 BC, almost 5000 years ago, he went in search of a place to, to be taken aloft and join the gods on their planet. Now the one, the first one that I showed you, this one, uh, is uh, in the mountains of Lebanon. Uh, the great cedar forest there is depicted and described uh, in detail in the uh, epic tale of Gilgamesh. And uh, he, the, the text says that he witnessed on the night before he entered or tried to enter the place, he saw a rocket launched. And lo and behold, uh, archaeologists have discovered a Phoenician coin from a place not far from there uh, that shows the great platform uh, and, uh, and a rocket ship on a, on a podium. Uh, so it did exist. Now that place still exists and can be visited. I went there at, uh, at some risk. I would not advise you uh, to go at this time because it's the headquarters of the Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, but the place is called Baalbek, and there is there a vast stone platform of about half a million square feet. And here at this northwestern corner, uh, there are ruins uh, of temples built over temples, over temples. The latest one are uh, Muslim and Byzantine and Roman, but they are built over, over, on or over a platform that pre-existed. And these are some of the most ancient uh, ruins that you see there uh, of uh, levels that keep rising from down there, rising and rising and rising and rising and rising. And these stone blocks weigh between 600 to 900 tons each. And uh, the, the immensity of the place is, is, is mind-boggling. Even more mind-boggling <coughs> is uh, one of the courses in the western wall of that uh, enclave, on the western wall, on top of these huge boulders, uh, and this, the three of them, one, two, and the third one, called known uh, as the triliton. <laughs> this is uh, the, Im the, the drawing, the image. This is a line drawing of a person, so you can see the scale. So there are three of these huge uh, stone blocks uh, lying in 
one of the courses, one of the levels next to each other. And they weigh 1,100 tons each. Now, there is no piece of equipment even today that can lift 1,100 1, tons or even 1,000 tons or even 600 tons. There's no, no such uh, piece of equipment. Yet, and this is a photograph, by the way. Uh, I think. Can, can, can you see that, that uh, little ant there? That's me. I'm standing there. And this is one, the first triliton, and then there are two more. <laughs> now we know where they came from, because about a mile and a half away, there is the quarry from which those stone blocks were uh, uh, cut, cut and lifted and brought. And one of the, them is unfinished. So right here it's still part, part of, the, of the native rock. And this part has been already cut. And, uh, and again, this is me there. So you can see the size. So somebody in antiquity and according to all the evidence before the flood, before the flood, uh, cut those stones and uh, lifted them uh, over a mile and a half and put them there, not on, drop them on the ground, but put them exactly where they should be, <laughs> where, where they belong. And the question is, what, what was the purpose of this whole thing? As I said, Gilgamesh, uh, reported that he saw a rocket ship uh, launch there, and the Phoenician coin also depicted. And uh, it was only after I saw photographs of uh, about a year ago, I think, of the Chinese launching their spacecraft for the first time. Now, we are used to uh, uh, launch towers Made, uh, made of metal and so on, uh, but, but this is also built out of uh, s some kind of stone. So I uh, have no doubt that what we see there now where is the one? Right, uh, because this is, all, this is exactly the same thing as the Chinese have built, because this starts somewhere there and goes down and down and down and down to well below ground. So this was a launch site uh, to which Gilgamesh went around 5,000 years ago in order to be lofted to the planet of the gods, Nibiru. But uh, he failed. And there's a whole tale that, that uh, he had a companion and they killed the, killed the sacred bull, the bull of heaven, and, and had to, to escape for their life. So it, it didn't work. So he went, he didn't give up. He went to the other destination, which, if you recall, <laughs> a previous slide was the spaceport, the spaceport in the Sinai Peninsula. And what was there we also know, uh, because the Egyptian has depicted it, and this is a depiction uh, found in the tomb of uh, a, an Egyptian called Hui, who was the governor in ancient times of the Sinai Peninsula. And in his tomb, uh, the, the, the burial chamber is surrounded on the walls with depictions of scenes from the lands where he uh, was an official. And this is from the Sinai, and I think uh, you can see that this is <coughs> an underground silo because you see the ground level with trees and giraffes, etc. And you see it multi stage rocket ship and the command module sticking out <coughs> from above ground. <coughs> so, this is what existed in the Sinai Peninsula. Oops, you go forward. Right. And uh, again, like in the Sumerian tales, there are Egyptian texts, there are 
the collection is called the Book of the Dead because the Egyptian pharaohs uh, claimed that uh, they have, uh, by being a pharaoh, they were uh, divine, semi-divine, demigods, and had the right after they died in an afterlife to join the gods in an afterlife. So after they died, according to the Book of the Dead, they went on a simulated journey to the spaceport, to where the uh, spacecraft or rocket ships are, and then to be taken aloft. And, this, and, and the Book of the Dead has many illustrations. This is uh, just one of them. And it shows the four pilots that welcomed, welcomed him aboard uh, the, the spacecraft, uh, one of the pharaohs. So there's no doubt that uh, there, too, the facility for being taken aloft did exist. <coughs> However, uh, it does not exist anymore. Baalbek still exists in ruins, but <coughs> the spaceport in the Sinai does not exist because uh, in one of the next wars uh, between uh, the various clans of the Anunnaki, uh, the Enlilites, the Enkiites, uh, Ninurta, Marduk, etc., they resorted to the use of nuclear weapons. And the spaceport in the Sinai was a target. And you can s see to this day two things. One is you can see the immense cavity to this day from space. This is a NASA photograph. And the crack in the, in the peninsula is the result. And if you go there, which I did by myself and with a group, uh, if you go there, you find in that particular s spot, you find in the middle of pure white limestone mountains. Everything is pure white. You see a huge field, a huge field with broken, burnt, and totally blackened rocks. And uh, one of the visits, I took samples. They were tested. They're possibly some radioactivity, but uh, it's, it's inconclusive. But uh, <laughs> it, in 2024, almost 4,000 years ago, <laughs> the Anunnaki resorted to the use of nuclear weapons. There is a long text called the Era, Era Epic, E-R-R-A Epic, that describes the reasons, who did it, how they did it, what the, the number of nuclear weapons that were used in 2024. The unintended consequence of that was that uh, a wind blowing from the Mediterranean uh, brought what they called in those texts, they're called lamentation texts, uh, they called the evil wind that brought death, death to everything alive in Sumer. As the nuclear wind passed, reaching from the Sinai to Sumer, uh, it did not destroy anything. The lamentation text lament that the stalls stand, but the, the animals that were there are all dead. The houses stand, but everybody who lived in the houses lies dead in the streets, on the roofs, etc. And that was the end of the great Sumerian civilization about 2024 BC. And in that one, unlike in the, pre, in the previous uh, uh, <coughs> wars, where Ninuta, the son of Enlil, was the victor, Marduk, Marduk, the son of Enki, was the victor, and that the, was the beginning of the rise of Babylon. Instead of Sumerian <coughs> and Enlil, and all the others, it was now the era and the time of Marduk and the Babylonians. Now we are starting to leave ancient history, and we are starting, or I'm starting, to take you uh, by the hand and lead you not only to the present, but also to the future. 
and to understand where history is taking us, this map is the key to it, and please try to remember it. If you recall the layout of the landing corridor from Mount Ararat this way, and Jerusalem as Mission Control Center, and the spaceport, the Giza pyramids, and the place in Lebanon called Baalbek today. These are the four space-related sites that if you keep them in mind, you understand what happened afterwards, what happened in recent times, and what the present conflict is all about. When the dust, let's use that expression, the dust of the nuclear explosion and the <coughs> demise of Sumer settled, uh, several hundred years later, when perhaps passage was possible again after the <coughs> use of nuclear weapons here, uh, a major event took place. Uh, it is called the Exodus, the Exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. And the Bible says that after about 400 years, God remembered. He said, oh, by the way, I forgot all about those people. <laughs> there was this guy, Abraham, and I promised him a certain land, the promised land. I made a covenant with him. And then I forgot all about it. But now it's time. It's time to... Uh, uh, fulfill my promises. And the Israelites left Egypt, and I didn't write it yet in any of my books, but I can tell you now that if I ever do, I will tell you that the starting point of the Exodus was the Sphinx, because the Sphinx, the Sphinx gazes precisely along the 30th parallel towards the spaceport. There was, of course, no more space for there, but the mountains remained, and the mountain which held the various facilities was there, and the Bible calls it Mount Sinai, the mount, the mount in the Sinai Peninsula, Har Elohim, the mountain of the gods, of the Anunnaki. So they were sent here on this exodus to resume the relationship, the commandments, etc., etc., uh, which, which, which required for them to proceed to accept all the moral teachings of the Sumerians. I, in, 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 I think in my very first book, The Twelfth Planet, I, and when I talk about the Sumerian law codes, I say everybody, uh, well, uh, most people <coughs> know about oh, the ancient law codes, Hammurabi, the Babylonian king, uh, his law code, which is uh, on a stone block in, in the Louvre in Paris, <coughs> is, is a code of crime and punishment. It says, if you did this, that's your punishment. The Sumerian law codes, and there's one, for example, by a king a thousand years before Hammurabi, 1400 years before Hammurabi, that was a law code of justice that said you shall not take away the donkey of a widow. You shall not delay the wages of a day laborer. Those were the Sumerian law codes. So these were the Sumerian commandments, the Sumerian moral, moral laws that had to be uh, re, re accepted, re renegotiated at Mount Sinai. And once they were, <coughs> they had to continue. There was difficulty in going straight, they went around, but anyway, finally they got to Jerusalem. And what did they do once they got to Jerusalem? They built the temple to Yahweh on a platform that existed there. And if you have not done it yet, I urge you to go to Jerusalem, because along the western wall, <coughs> there's of course doesn't exist anymore. This is now replaced by a Muslim structure. <coughs> Along this western wall, 
just as along the western wall in Baalbek, in the landing place of Gilgamesh. And this is an aerial photograph. Uh, this is with the area that's called the Temple Mount. <coughs> and this is where the temple stood, and the Holy of Holies, and the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> Interestingly enough that I noticed when I was there and when looking at there, that there are trees, trees everywhere, but not here. Nothing grows here. <coughs> so this is the western wall, and <coughs> an opening was made along the western wall <coughs> after being blocked for uh, thousands of years. And uh, what was discovered there is mind-boggling because in the same place, the western wall, as in the landing place where Gilgamesh went, there is a triliton, not of 1,100,000 tons, but only six or 700 tons, three immense stone blocks lying one next to the other, just as there, <coughs> and uh, uh, somewhere there, uh, anyway, somewhere there, there is a sign that says that this is exactly <coughs> where a tunnel leads to the Holy of Holies <coughs> on <coughs> above the platform. Uh, this is another shot <coughs> of the triliton uh, in, in Jerusalem. <coughs> Now, when Yahweh, the God of the Bible, uh, commanded uh, David and then Solomon <coughs> uh, to build a temple exactly on a pre-existing uh, platform, uh, this is what uh, he said. These are exact words in translation. Uh, and if you, I cannot read from this angle. Will anybody read out loud, please? Thus has said the Lord Yahweh, this right. is Jerusalem. In the midst of the nations I placed her, and all the lands are in a circle round about her. Well, in the midst of the nations, in the center of the circles. Well, that <coughs> could not be more explicit that uh, <coughs> this is the layout <coughs> of the mission control center. <coughs> Now, at about the time that uh, the Hebrews, the Israelites, <coughs> were uh, restoring the platform in Jerusalem, uh, other things were happening in the adjoining countries, especially those countries that followed uh, uh, Marduk, the Babylonian one. Uh, in Babylonia, <coughs> on cylinder seals, the sign of the cross began to appear. <clears throat> in Assyria, the kings began to wear the sign of the cross on their chest. <clears throat> the same happened in Egypt. Now these are all from around 1000 BC, 900 BC, 800 BC, 700 BC. <clears throat> now what does it mean? What what does it signify? Well, the sign of the cross, it may come as a surprise to my Christian friends, the sign of the, the, sign of the cross is not a new sign, and a new, not a sign uh, is developed or invented at the time of Jesus. This is a very ancient Sumerian sign, and each time that the planet, Nibiru, that usually was depicted as a winged disk, was on its way back to our vicinity. Each time that the reappearance of Nibiru was expected, the depiction, the symbolism for Nibiru, for the planet, changed from the winged disk to the cross. So this one, for example, this is the one of the most ancient ones. Uh, this is another one. This is when agriculture was granted to mankind, <coughs> and so on. And if you look at uh, uh, the, the orbit of Nibiru, <coughs> uh, roughly 3,600 years, I, uh, in my book, The, uh, <coughs> the End of Days, I 
explain why the orbit might have become a little shorter, only 3,450 years. But anyway, we can <coughs> work with this 3,600, which is a, uh, a good round number, and part of the sexagesimal system. 6, 10, 60, 360, 3,600. So, <coughs> so from the time that Nibiru uh, was in our vicinity, making the great round around the sun, which is called the perigee, the point closest to the sun, uh, he goes out, slows down, slows down, reaches this point, the apogee, and then starts on its way back. So at some point, uh, the planet is here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here. And at some point, the anticipation of its return begins. <clears throat> and this, I suggest, <clears throat> is when the sign of the cross uh, began to reappear. <clears throat> In one of my books, The Wars of Gods and Men, I deal with all the various wars that uh, took place, not only <clears throat> the very early ones, but in particular, the ones that started to become more frequent and more ferocious as the return of Nibiru became closer and closer. <clears throat> it, it seems as if it became much more important uh, who would be in control, uh, who would welcome them, whose particular uh, aspect of religion <coughs> would be more predominant, uh, etc. And uh, it was at that time, uh, precisely around 750 BC, <coughs> that the biblical prophecies also started. They started with the prophet Amos around 750 BC. <coughs> now, in general, uh, no distinction is made by people uh, writing on the subject uh, and most of whom really don't know Hebrew, so they <coughs> rely on translations. Uh, <coughs> the, the, the whole thing, biblical prophecy, is taken as, a <coughs> as one <laughs> lump sub subject. But if you know Hebrew, and if you study uh, the various prophecies in great detail, and know the precision of the Hebrew language, you begin to see that the prophets were really talking about two different things. One was called the Day of the Lord. And Amos spoke about it. Uh, another, I think, I quote Habakkuk. I, you can't see from this angle. <coughs> uh, uh, anyway, they started to talk about the Day of the Lord the day of the Lord is coming, the day of the Lord is near, and it was described as a time of celestial phenomena. There would be darkness at noon. You will not be able to see the stars at night. Uh, the moon will not shine its light, etc. <coughs> and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. I don't know if it's easy for you. I, I had about 30 slides with all these biblical quotations, but I realized that it was <coughs> very difficult even for the audience to, <coughs> to read them. So uh, at the same time, similar, similar prophecies known as Akkadian prophecies, Assyrian prophecies, Babylonian prophecies, began to also talk about the return, uh, the, 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 the celestial Lord would, would come from the south, uh, would, would be first seen in this constellation and so on. And I drew some of these charts to show you and show how you can relate some of the text to the progress of uh, Nibiru coming back to Earth's vicinity. <coughs> Uh, this is another sketch that really renders as a sketch literal, literal wording, saying you first can see it from there, you, then you can see it here, and so on, and so forth, as the planet returns. <clears throat> there were even 
discoveries of astronomical records. These are called astrolabs uh, because they depict uh, <coughs> the, the uh, circular heavens around Earth on, 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 on plain uh, paper with, with all the stars being named, <coughs> where the uh, progression of Nibiru uh, from being seen uh, in this part of the heavens uh, to being seen in this part of the heavens at its apogee, its perigee, uh, is, is actually recorded as having been witnessed and seen by uh, Assyrian and Babylonian astronomers. <coughs> well, this is one, <coughs> one, uh, one of the texts accompanying one of the astrologs. And uh, uh, as becomes obvious as you study all these uh, texts, that <coughs> they are the main feature they are talking about is a day of darkness, darkness at noon, the sun will not be seen, etc., <coughs> which uh, we can say uh, they are really talking about the solar eclipse. <coughs> and uh, the Assyrian <coughs> records, I think that's what I showed in the previous slide, uh, talk about uh, a, a darkness at noon and an eclipse at, a, at an unexpected time because all these eclipses could be predicted. They had enough knowledge to predict solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, etc. So in exactly 556 BC, and this is a, a sketch, a sky map prepared by NASA, uh, not by me. In 556, an unusual and unexpected uh, eclipse, darkness at noon uh, took place. And uh, it is my conclusion in the book, The End of Days, that that is exactly when Nibiru last was near Earth and uh, created <laughs> that eclipse. So if you uh, go back uh, to uh, <coughs> the problem posed by 2012, <coughs> and you say, well, 2012 uh, is when Nibiru is expected to return and do this or do that, and be a good omen or bring uh, uh, harmful things, it will be the apocalypse, the end. Uh, it, it, it does not work because the last time that Nibiru was near Earth was 556 BC and if it has an orbit of about 3600, 3400, 3500 years uh, it ain't coming back in 2012. <coughs> uh, <coughs> So what might happen, if not in 2012, in some other time, uh, in our lifetimes perhaps? And this takes me to the other part which of the biblical prophecies where I told you that there were really two, two things that were discussed and prophesied from about 750 BC to about 550 BC, the time of Ezekiel, they spoke about the day of the Lord, the celestial Lord. It's coming, it's nearing, it's coming from the south, it, it will darken the skies, etc., etc. But then the other part, they switched to a term called Acharita Yamim, the end of days, which some translate end time or any other way people want to translate. But the time, the time, the question is what do we mean by time? But Whatever we call time will come to an end. <coughs> and we have to remember, and this is the purpose of this slide to show you, that the Anunnaki were coming and going between their planet and the Earth, not necessarily when Nibiru, 
was closest to Earth. As a matter of fact, they could not, they could not do that because it is at, at this point that the planet, their planet, that slows down here, gains speed, and moves fastest around the sun. So the only way they could come here was if they left their planet ahead of time and speeded ahead of the planet and were here and then rejoined their planet or when the planet was starting on the way back to slow down then they would as if literally fall back towards the sun and come to our vicinity. So there were all kinds of ways and there are tales. There are tales about this god, this goddess. There is a tale about a king called the Tanha who was taken uh, to heaven. He was afraid to continue uh, the trip when he started to see the earth become smaller and smaller. Uh, there was one of the uh, uh, sons of Enki by an earthling woman uh, called Adapa. Uh, who was taken for a visit with Anu in heaven, taken and brought back. So he did not stay uh, 3,600 years uh, on Ibiru. So comings and goings are possible even when Nibiru is not precisely at its closest <coughs> to us. And uh, what did happen, what did happen, uh, in 556 BC, when so many of the other nations uh, expected uh, the Anunnaki to show up again, is that instead of showing up, they left. Um, I don't have the slides here, and I'm not in, intending to spend <laughs> more time uh, because I'm way beyond my, my time already. But uh, in, in the book, in the book, I uh, suggest that the point of departure was the famous uh, Nazca lines in South America. Uh, but uh, what is without doubt known, and this is <coughs> perhaps part of the Mayan prophecies, is that <coughs> the chief deity of Mesoamerica, uh, whom the uh, Aztecs called Quetzalcoatl, uh, the uh, Mayan called Cucu, <coughs> Uh, which all meant the plumed or the winged serpent. Uh, before he left, uh, he said, this is written down, he said, I will return, I promise to return. And he promised uh, to return at a certain point, uh, which is uh, uh, related to the Mesoamerican calendars. Now, the so-called Mayan calendar, uh, where the whole business of 2012 uh, appears, is really a calendar called the Long Count, uh, which was uh, started not by the Mayas, was started by the Olmecs, people from Africa who were brought over uh, by uh, Quetzalcoatl, that I identified as the Egyptian god Toth, <coughs> were brought over in 3113 BC. And uh, this is the calendar that the Mayas used. Uh, the, the whole business of 2012 uh, is based because the calendar, its various symbols depict <coughs> uh, one day or 20 days or uh, 360 days, etc. And this is uh, <coughs> called this. This one is called the Baktun, and 13 Baktuns, 13 Baktuns will culminate in, by some calculation, <coughs> 2012. Now, uh, it depends how one calculates, because it depends if you divide uh, the days by 365 or by 360. <coughs> one way that has been suggested only a century ago really arrives at 2087 as the Mayan uh, 13th Baktun. But uh, in general, um, my, my feeling is that it is not applicable at all <coughs> because if you uh, 
uh, follow the, the biblical prophecies, uh, they are dealing with a cyclical timetable. Uh, the the this so-called Mayan calendar is a linear one, like day one, day two, day three, etc. The same as the AD calendar, uh, 2000, 2001. Why nothing happened 2000? Because after 2000 came 2001, like I showed you at the beginning. And some said 2000, then said 2003, 2000. All, all, the, all the predictions in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, speak of a cycle. The, the beginning will be the ending. The ending is the beginning. The past is the future. And this can take place only in a cyclical thing. And what was, uh, is more, more quotes <coughs> of the same subject, about <coughs> the end of days and what will happen there. <coughs> now, the, the best clues uh, in, in the Old Testament about uh, this whole business of the end of days when, when will it be, not only what will happen, but when will it be, is in the book of Daniel. Uh, I just <laughs> almost skipped fast because <coughs> it takes too long to start reading all that. <coughs> but one of those, one of those that really devoted uh, the better part of his life to studying the meaning of the prophecies and the timetable given in the book of Daniel. And there's some number of years and number of years, but the best clue is where the angels tell Daniel, the end of days will come after half time, time, and two times. And Daniel, like <laughs> we say, what do you mean by that? What what half time are you talking about? Are you not talking about football, right? <laughs> uh, and he was left with, 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 with no answer. So Sir Isaac Newton, who is known more about uh, celestial orbits and such other things, spent most of his time delving into those prophecies and trying to calculate them. And a handwritten document by him came, came to light uh, relatively recently, two, two, three years ago. And when it came to light, the, the news uh, headlines were that uh, Sir Isaac Newton calculated the end of days at 2,160 AD. Um, I was fortunate to be able to obtain a photocopy of that handwritten page, <coughs> which is written front and back. In the book, The End of Days, I give what it says, I quote what it says, I do not show the photographs, because I have no permission to do that. So you are now seeing, you are the first ones to see the photograph of the handwritten document by Sir Isaac Newton. And he calculated also in, in three ways. And the number 2160 does indeed feature, feature heavily in his calculations. But when I looked at his calculations on the back of the page, I said, oh my God, he is talking about zodiacal times, <clears throat> because one of the things, again, a so-called Sumerian first, was the, the devising of the zodiac, of uh, calculating how the earth uh, on, on, on the first day of spring here, uh, after a full year, does not precisely return to where it was, but is slightly retarded, the retardation 
amounts to one degree of 360 in 72 years and a 30 degree zodiacal house, therefore 30 times 72 is 2,160. So the mathematical zodiacal time is 2,160 years. And there's no doubt, though, the, the beginning of the zodiac is attributed to, to, to the Greeks, that the Sumerians knew it, they named all the 12 zodiacal constellations in the correct order. This is all Sumerian names. <coughs> they depicted them the way we still <coughs> use to this day. So there's no doubt that uh, <coughs> they, they knew the zodiacal times. But again, as with other things, how could they? How could any mortal Sumerian not only measure the uh, the delay of one degree in 72 years, but of 30 degrees of the shift from one zodiacal house to another in 2,160 years? And the answer is that, again, this was a Anunnaki, Anunnaki device and not a <coughs> Sumerian device. And what is uh, uh, important uh, to, uh, to keep in mind is that the time, the time scale, so that's when the ancients told Daniel time, time, half time, two times, that they were talking about divine time, the Anunnaki time, is because I ask myself, and I, I give <coughs> that answer also in the book, The End of Days, is what, what prompted, what caused the Anunnaki in 2024 BC to resort to the use of nuclear weapons? What, <laughs> you know, what was the problem? And the problem was that Marduk said that the age of the bull, the age of Taurus, which was the age of Enlil, is ending, he said, and my age, the age of the Rem, the age of Arius, is beginning. He claimed that this is the correct zodiacal scale. So he said around 2200 BC, the age of Enlil, the age of Taurus, has ended, and my age, the age of Arius, has begun. The others, and this is all in those texts, by the way, the others said to him, no, you are wrong, because don't go by some chart. Look at the heavens. In the heavens, on the first day of spring, we are still in the age of the bull. We are still in the age of Taurus. Why? Because the three, the three zodiacal constellations of the bull of the ram and of Pisces are not the same size. So, though Marduk claimed that his age has already begun, it was still observationally really in the heavens the age of still of Enlil, of his rivals, the Nurta and so on. So, this was such a bitter fight that uh, they resorted <coughs> to nuclear weapons uh, to deprive each other of the space form. Now, there is another cylinder seal. Uh, it is a, at the Hermitage Museum in Russia. Uh, there's no doubt about its date. It's 2500 BC. And it shows, in my opinion, without doubt, an astronaut on the sixth planet, which is Mars, greeting an astronaut on the seventh planet, which is Earth. You remember, I ask you to keep it in mind, Earth and its moon. And between them, there is a spacecraft. So, a return of the Anunnaki with a stopover on Mars, one greeting the other, 
has occurred. And there is a date. There is a date on this cylinder seal. Do you see the date? Pisces. The age of Pisces. The age of Pisces. So does this mean that the return of the Anunnaki and the end of days with its 2,160-year calculation will still come about this century? Maybe. Because. <laughs> because. There is a because, ladies and gentlemen. Because just at the place that in according to the New Testament is called Armageddon, where the final war will take place, a mosaic floor in the first church ever built in the Holy Land, in, in the time of Jesus, has on its floor this, the sign of Pisces. This was discovered two or three years ago at Armageddon, which really means in Hebrew, Har Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo, which is in Israel. <laughs> 